All right. Uh, just before I start, I want to acknowledge uh, the work that went into this project through the couple of council guys who worked with Jason Grancourt and Shannon Gorman at uh, Mackay Regional Council. Uh, this is a project where we three of us worked together from the start, from strategies all the way through the tender processes, through to contract completion and conform contracts, um, and to settling the processes down. It's one based on some years of work together. Um, but it's one of those things I think you all recognise, or many of you recognise, collaborative work where you trust each other, you know each other and you can task share, reallocate work during the work. Um, the scope of the work, rather than worrying about absolute boundaries, makes for a very efficient process overall and, and got us some very good outcomes. And both of those guys were, were critical in getting to that point. Um, what I want to talk about this afternoon in the context of shaping the paper is, is just step through in seven things. Talk about context, because in this particular case, the context, the background of the landfill in particular is really important in terms of how we, what we changed and how we did it this time. Um, and the nature of the, the change, particularly in terms of the economy and the business. And this, this picture here is of Paget Transfer Station. Um, in the context, it was originally a design bid, bid build contract. ACOM did the design of the transfer station. They also did the original design of the landfill, the EIS for the landfill works, um, when they were done back in the early noughties. So what do we do? Um, one of the things that we do at Mackay, which is particularly relevant, is we group all of the tenders together. Um, this goes back uh, early 2000s. Mackay had an inner city landfill which between the port and the city at a place called Bayersville, just up the road from the uh, dog pound and one of the central treatment plants, but it was literally on the road between um, the, the port, the redeveloping area of the city and the main city centre. Bit of an eyesore. Uh, the mayor was determined to change it. It was right, it was going full anyway, and so there was a, an aggregation of contracts uh, Greens Council was looking at AWT um, and evaluating it, though, but they were reshaping the contract. And this was a change at the time of double the rates to include for um, full-on recycling and changing the landfill or triple the rates if you went with AWT. Um, and it was making that observation that put Council in the context of maybe we'll only double the rates and we'll leave AWT for the moment. Um, but they were keen to make sure they could revisit it. So what we did is, is took all the contracts and made sure we put terms on them so they literally all came back together in a group about a year apart, 10 years in the future. So that when strategy came up again, council had the opportunity to revisit and wasn't blocked out by timing issues as to which way they went with future contracts and combinations of processes. Um, and that led us to things where it's quite easy to then realign at that renewal period and, and change, the, change the complete strategy of the city if, it, if you wanted to. This time we also had some amalgamation effects to bring into account, so in between there being council amalgamation, had um, Serena and Marani Shires got amalgamated with Mackay City, in fact Shannon was from, from Serena, so he came into Mackay Regional Council, um, and then we other, so we had, as well as the amalgamation, we looked at some other groupings as well, what were the interfaces between transfer station and pit floor operations, which have been a bit of a problem over the last 10 years, um, the resource recovery facility and the transfer station. Um, and went through a complete strategic review of those. The, the suite of contracts we ended up putting out was um, quite common. We had collection services, waste recyclables with a green waste option. Um, the MRF, we had acceptance and processing, so it was a rebuild DBOM when we'd done that 10 years ago. It was a deep design, build, operate, maintain contract, first time up, which Fiola had run. Um, the whole expectation then was that 10 years the equipment be stuffed, um, and it was. Um, but risk is all with Veolia, they had to make it last through to the end. And when we did the rebuild contract, we gave people the option of you know, just, there's the building, take it out and refurb. And um, there's some articles in the past and other papers been given about that refurb and how successful that was. Uh, resource recovery, the shop, um, the shop and operate the, the pick off in the shop. Uh, minor transfer stations, a row row haulage contract, CND waste recycling, green waste, Padger transfer station the transfer station operations, the pit floor, and then the waste haulage and landfills service, which is this contract's largely about, or this paper's largely about. So for each one of those, we looked at it in terms of what's changed in the forward strategy, what's council done in terms of, you know, what are the councillors' expectations of where they want to go on strategy, how does that influence the contract mix, what have we got to change? 
Um, for example, we re-examined green waste as a curbside collection, put some options in for that for a roll out of that, test the market, find out what the prices were going to be so we could put it to council and say, here's your cost increase to go to green waste. Um, reviewed scope, specs, reviewed our bundling, and the ones I just mentioned, how we're going to pull that together. Um, and some examples of those change. Um, the MRF, for example, we did the rebuild or take and ship, so they could just use the existing building um, as a bulk uh, transfer point, uh, but we did add glass crushing because one of the things we'd had was this historical issue of the volume of fines and waste um, from the previous MRF had been mostly in glass fines and glass breakage, um, so we took up the capital grant opportunity um, and put a glass crushing machine in and that's had a, in fact a major success of that contract. Uh, and council reuses, just for the side note, council reuses all the glass fines in its, in its uh, civil works operations. The minor transfers, row row haulage, we had it only been a three inside Mackay, so it hadn't been a significant contract and had been wrapped in at that stage with the waste haulage and landfill contract. Once we'd picked up uh, Serena and Mirani, we had a, another dozen small landfills, uh, so, sorry, small transfer stations and closed landfill sites that we had to pick up. They were all on individual contracts. Uh, Richards had some, Viola had some, Cleanaway had some. And when we put it out, we rolled that over, but we also put in an option for a four year, do it all, do it over four years in price, which we thought would be enough to actually write off a new fleet of row row bins in a, in a vehicle. In fact, that was the case, and Suez came in with the best offer and did exactly that. Um, so it proved worth doing those. We put a C&D re waste recycling out, um, partly because at that stage, with the way the economy was going in Mackay, out of 100, um, thousand tonnes a year going into the landfill, 20,000 tonne plus was ending up as C&D waste from all the construction works. Uh, by the time we got out to tender and evaluated it, that had dropped down to just over 80,000 tonnes and the C&D waste was down to 8,000. So the C&D has been parked for another day. And it shows the effect of an economy in a place like Mackay, what happens when the market turns down, just the impact it has on your landfill and transfer station business. And in this case, the one the paper is about the waste haul and landfill contract. And the big issues there were leachate risk um, and fleet optimisation. Um, one of the things, just a side note, one of the things about Hogan's Pocket Landfill, which is 50 k's out of town, so it's you know, a big change for the city back in the early noughties, as I said, from unlined tip in the middle of town to a lined landfill, um, properly engineered lined landfill, 50 k's south of, south of the city. Um, is bringing in some of the other transfer stations. So the only three things that go to the landfill are the, the haulage from Paget Transfer Station in the city, some of the pickups from the railroads, so Serena Transfer Station, in this case one of the newer ones, um, gets hauled direct, but about half of them actually get dumped on an irregular basis and they get hauled only to Paget. So it's, a, it's like a kangaroo hop we reload because it's cheaper that way. And that was one of the options we tested in the railroad contract. Uh, and the only other thing you can do is booked in access. So there's no direct public access to the landfill. It's only large loads and all has to be booked in. We use a web-based booking system. There are allocated times up to three o'clock in the afternoon so that there's no, no there's having to keep the gates open until late and effectively avoids the costs of an extra person full-time at the landfill. Um, history and context for this in terms of the waste haul contract. Um, the original one, as I said, was a landfill being closed out in town, so a brand new landfill, the EIS had been done, brand new site, written the contracts from scratch, uh, got a new transfer station and set it up. So council hasn't got any expertise at all in operating a land, an engineered landfill or a large sail fleet. It's literally been running um, with a compactor and a dozer, a small fill in the middle of town and nothing else. Um, so the decision was made at that stage with council, go to tier one, go out to the market, get the tier one contractors involved, bring in the landfill operations expertise, don't try and skill up yourself. Uh, and that's when we opened the contract back in 2004. There were some risks known, just a sort of pleasant thing to find out when you're sitting there having got an engineering background and you talk about the contracts with ACOM and what's going to be in the landfill, is that they were pretty sure the leachate pond wasn't big enough that they'd built into the landfill. I thought that's a useful thing to find out just as when you're about to put the tenders out and how much do you inform the market as to whether, whether that was the case, but they assured us it had all been written up in the EIS and a competent contractor would find that out by reading the EIS documents. Um, so we went out to tier one contractors, made sure we picked people who could take the risk. Um, and of course, pretty soon, within about a year of starting up, 
fill wasn't being managed well, they had no cover, they hadn't built in the right corner of the cell, spread it out over the base and we got the back end of a cyclone pretty much a year into the things and it flooded the site. Um, and that's when we realised what leachate risks really were in an improperly managed landfill. Um, so a lot of a lot of contract debate, took some years to settle that one out. There was a lot of wastewater got taken out of town. It also just the separate contracts, just put DBO contracts together for a new treatment plant on the south side of Mackay um, and shunting a whole bunch, a whole sack of leachate into that wasn't going to fit with that contract at risk allocation either. So it was a bit of crossover between Council's two major projects in terms of risk allocation. Um, but that eventually got tidied up. We got practices in place, um, moved on to the new cell. So, so this was... Let me get this. This is, cell, this is the original cell one at the top of the top of Hogan's pocket. Cell two and then cell three is being built down here. Um, due in 2016, but delayed due to wet weather. Um, the original small leachate pond, which wasn't big enough, had been taken out and building cell two, and this is the new one at this stage down here when cell two was built. And then two major sed ponds to cater for the runoff that you tend to find um, up north. Um, there'd been some changes in the fleet on the way through, so T services had picked it up, um, then Remondus, and they'd switched to high volume side tippers part way through the contract, part of their fleet optimisation. And so council was very much aware that there were opportunities to optimise fleet as part of the, the entire mix when you went through the rest of the contract. So we looked at the, the risk and opportunities that since what, particularly since this is council's biggest contract, so um, net present cost of about $40 million, what were the opportunities? What could we take? What was the strategy? Um, first of all, in terms of change of fleet. So first principle, let's, let's let the market tell us what the best combination of fleet is. Let's let them turn around. We've looked at the, we've already looked at the transfer station. There have been some issues with capacity when the sort of tonnages was hitting the 100 kilotons a year. Um, might have had to build a north side transfer station. Troy Uren had already done some studies on that and picked up, look, you can run B doubles through. You've got issues with loading times though. So this is a risk you really need to push across to the contractors. They need to make that balance between configuration and load time from the pit and run time to the landfill. Um, so we flicked that out. Um, we looked at the route. We established what the costs were. We got Council's road group. We said about $690,000 to upgrade the road, upgrade the transfer station to do the switch to B-doubles. We thought well, that looks like it'll pay for itself but not going to make a call based on internal estimates. Let's push it to the market and test it. Um, there was a trick in the back end. We weren't sure if we could get all the permits for the road um, to do the work, so we left it as an option and made sure they priced the baseline of a um, concessional mass limit semis, making sure we had that option in our pocket in case we couldn't get the rest of it. And, of course, we had the risk of fluctuating tonnages. We had already had this thing to go from 100,000 tonne down to 80,000. We had to make sure that they did the fleet adjustments for that. There was a change in leachate ops. We now knew what the risk was. We now knew the site flooded, they'd found a spring, there'd been all sorts of issues with the site. So this was something we weren't sure anyone was ever going to, certainly remind us wasn't going to take on the risk again. They knew how bad it was. But how do you go to a council when you've had 10 years of, a, of the market taking the risk of operational leachate and convince them you need to spend money on a capital solution before you've gone to tender? So that was a key issue for us. And that's what we got ready with in terms of real limits. We found out what the cost of disposal of leachate was and we decided as a thing to then put that to the market, the tender process. We went out, we engaged with the market, we made it clear this is the options we're exploring. So we got all the tenderers in in a briefing and said, guys, this is, this is literally what we're looking at. Here are the options on, on fleet. Here's our cost to upgrade. So we told them the capital cost and that was a big debate inside council. Do we disclose what the capital spend for council is between the two options. Um, and after some debate, no, he said, look, you've got to tell them. Um, the concern in council being, oh, they'll game it and they'll make sure it's only that price difference between the two options. And the argument we put in said was that might be the case, except for the fact they're in competition with each other as well. And they don't know what the other guy's price is. So there's no point gaming it on the basis they're the only tenderer because they'll miss out and they could miss out overall. Um, on the leachate side, the thing, the difficult thing we had to do um, in the context of the process, was effectively prove you couldn't do it without doing capital works um, on the leachate. So what we put in the tender is said you had to tender an operational solution only, like no capex, no upgrade to leachate ponds. Give us a tender which gives us operational solutions. Look at equipment on the thing, look at evaporator enhancements and sprays and pumps and do whatever else you can. 
but you have to price that option. And then you can have a capital solution as well. And we explained to, explained to the market what we're doing, what we're expecting, so they're all clear on what we're after, uh, and then put that out. And then make sure we had contract terms that dealt with all those options. What happened as a result is the market did engage on those risks. Um, and they came back, not unexpectedly, but you never know unless you ask the market. Uh, which, as councillors will always remind you when you go out with tender, how do you know? Right? Unless you ask, how do you know what you're going to get? Uh, but they actually all came back and rejected the operations only contract. I mean, sure, they gave us a price, but they gave us a price with a series of conditions extracted and, you know, I only do this for the first five megs of leach eight and then it's back to council to pay. So we had, in effect, for the business case that rolled out, we now had, a, we now had the price of no change, of, of the zero capital solution. What the risks were, what the prices, impacts were, um, and the fact that it was just generally unacceptable to market. So what we pushed in is we went back to them, redesigned leachate pond, got ACOM to knock that up, got an estimate for that work, about $2 million worth of capital spend, so quite a significant spend in the context of the contract for, to put the leachate pond put the leachate pond in, went back out, because we indicated to tender as we would, went back out, changed it, put that back out to market and said, right, there's 15 mega leachate pond. We specified some minimum on-site practices, so we recognising that you know, people can game you with water trucks and what they spray and what they lose to surface evap, and said, no, you have to get this many hours a day, dedicated resource of, of distribution on the site surfaces, because we'd had the um, modelling to pick it up and knew what they could get rid of and put that solution back out and then re-evaluated the tender. Um, in the end, that all worked. We got offers are acceptable. Suez came up um, with the ANTS, ANTS in terms of solution, went with CML semis. Um, the B double option in the end didn't work because not, not on a cost basis, but because the landowner who had the access that we need to trim and who we, who's right next door to the landfill, so you've got to keep him happy, changed his mind on whether or not he wanted to let council upgrade the roads, so took that option away. Was the things, it wasn't the thing we were expecting in the process, it was, it was that aspect of it. Um, put that out um, and then went back and got ahead with the contract and now it's being implemented. I guess the things, just to close in, the list, things we learned out of that, um, engaging the market is, is worth every penny. Get to the contractors, test the options, make sure you've got the flexibility in it so you don't get caught with tender regulations of... And that was the important thing we did. We set up all the options at the start, so we weren't going back halfway through a tender process and fundamentally changing the deal. We went out and said, these are the options from the start that we may look at, and therefore when we did change and narrow the spec, it was, perfect, it was within the scope of what we'd originally gone to market with. Um, we tested engineering that way. That was good. You know, the council had one engineer, but by the time we then had two different arms of Golders and another group coming in with the tenderers, as well as the tenderers' own engineering groups coming in, looking at telling us different options, different way to manage the leachate. We let council know what we were doing, so they were expecting that process to happen. They were expecting the second round, they were expecting the business case to come in for capital works if it was required to come in with a tender evaluation. Um, I think things we'd rather do better, I'd rather not, you'd rather not use the market to test rejection of risk, um, but that's, you know, we sort of hinted at that in the presentation and said that said to the tenderers, guys, it's the only way we've got to prove it. And, and sort of, until you reject it, you know, we don't know what we can do. So it's, that's just a matter of sticking with the process. Um, I think you'd rather get better modelling to tell you what might actually happen with leachate practices on site, but um, and literally this is Suez and Ramondas um, and others picking up Veolia, picking up the best engineers in the country and their own engineers and no one's giving us here's the perfect answer in terms of what's going to happen with leachate, particularly with the variation in rainfall you get up in Mackay. Um, and we probably could have done a bit more work on configuring our services spec, but that's just you know, money and benefit. I think the other lessons, you don't always get all the optimisations. Um, one of the tenderers picked up halfway through and said, you're actually changing the contract over in February, it's the middle of the wet season, and you're going to a new cell. Maybe it'd be a good idea to push that back by a few months. Um, we did, smartest thing we ever did, because of course Cyclone Debbie just hit us smack in the middle of when the contract changeover otherwise would have been. So that, w that was the best answer of the lot. And uh, I think Chris White from Suez is still running around claiming a lot of credit for making the best decision in that regard. Thank you.